My name is Ray, and I have the pleasure of having Dr. James Ellis, the inventor of Himplan, and Dr. Adam DeFazio from Miami. Thank you for being with me today. Sure. Pleasure. Okay. Welcome to LN. Thank you. Dr. DeFazio, how long have you been with the Himplan team? Has it been already a couple of years now? It's over two years now. Yeah. So I came out, I think, in May 2022 to meet Dr. Ellis initially. Um, started the training back then, and I got to see a prior generation of the implant, and I've seen it progress since then. And um, yeah, you know, it's been an excellent journey so far and, you know, it's really happy to be here and be part of the team and contributing to its, its ongoing evolution. So why don't you tell us, Dr. Ellis, is there an actual difference? Is there a design change? It, it's just an improvement, you know, the, all the implants, you know, since uh, 2004 that we got the FDA clearance, still there are some patients, you know, that they have the original implant. Originally, when I start to perform this procedure, Based on our past experience, we made incision in the suprabubic area. But gradually we find out, you know, that the, the stretching, because we need the skin in the suprapubic at some point just to stretch. So I changed the incision to the lateral incision on the scrotum. The vascularity of the scrotum is very high, so the healing is very good. And because it does not uh, have any effect on the suprapubic the skin, so the skin gradually can move down. It doesn't leave any scar, any line or anything, okay? It is visible, but it's not that much because it goes to the fold, so it stays there. Patients are very, very satisfied, you know, with that incision, and we use the sutures, you know, it dissolves in a matter of few weeks, you know, so the patient feels very, very comfortable. So changing the incision from suprapubic to lateral, changing the implant also, the mesh, I think, you know, has been great improvement and uh, higher satisfaction for our patient. Well, we're going to turn to Dr. DeFazio. What has been your experience so far? You know, how do you feel about the procedure overall now that you've done many? Yeah, I saw the, the prior approach. And I think from a, a technical standpoint, it certainly is a smoother procedure now for the surgeon. Right. If there are a lot of surgeries I'll talk to patients about and say, oh, you know, there are two options of doing this. It doesn't really matter for you. It's, it's kind of like you don't care what sort of knife your, your chef uses at a restaurant. You care that the food tastes good. Or I think this is sort of a bit of both. I think it makes it easier on us as surgeons, but I think the outcomes are, are, are better. That's and this is from what I just talked to you about that. I've only seen my own patients with the, the, the newest generation, but um, it, it certainly seems like a lot of uh, prior issues are, uh, have been addressed with the new implant. The patients are, are certainly happier with the, uh, the, the current generation. So it's, it's, it's better for us as surgeons, uh, making an easier procedure to perform. And I think it's also better for the patients in terms of satisfaction and outcome. I've realized that not that many people know actually what goes into the design of the implant. So Dr. Ellis, can you explain why there's a ridge in the middle on top and what is the function of that as the implant so we can okay. explain further? Let me tell you something, you know, which is very interesting, you know, this is for the first time in the history of medicine you know, and surgery that we put the implant under the penile skin for any kind of expansion or extension of the penis, okay? This ridge is there because, you know, the implant has to bend and open during the erection, okay? So here also, it's like a hinge. It's like a door, okay? So I designed it somewhere because I didn't want the implant just to sit just without any mobility. Penis is one of the most mobile <laughs> part of our body, you know, that constantly is moving, okay? So on the flaccid, when you put it there, I was thinking, you know, what happened with erection? If this one does not at this hinge, the implant does not open, okay? Even surgeon, they asked me, why you didn't make it 360 degrees, okay? And definitely the answer is very simple, no. For the urologist, I'm sure Dr. DeFazio or other people has been asking why you don't make it that? Because you know urethra should be open, okay? So this area which is here is the urethra and the urethra should not be covered because most of these patients at a certain point in their uh, life, they might go for some other procedure for bladder, for cystoscopy, for a stone or for other procedure. And this one you know, should be enough open, you know, just to have uh, the other uh, instrument, you know, passing through the area. Dr. DeFazio, I'm going to ask you this question. Why this part is so thin and why this part is so thick, as you can see here? How do you insert this? How does it sit? Do you mind just taking this and walk us through how this whole procedure works? Yeah, no, absolutely. Again, I, I think this is probably the second most common question patients 
uh, present to us is why is there a ridge? Why is that 360 exactly. degrees? And why is it so thin on one end and thick on the other? All right, so the, the thin end, it's tapered. So the base is super thick right here. And you see the, the part that's towards the head of the penis is very thin. It's designed this way for a few reasons. I mean, one, if you actually look at the natural contour of the penis, you're going to see that it actually tapers inwards towards the glands. Yeah. Also having less thickness here is going to make it less conspicuous, right? If we were to try to slide this end under the skin, it'd be sort of a, a rigid step off, wouldn't be aesthetically pleasing. It would look abnormal. Right. And that's one of the selling points of this, of this device is right. that it appears completely natural. Right. They sort of expect this, you know, perfectly cylindrical oh, look. And, right. and Dr. Ellis' design is accounted for the natural, natural sort of anatomy. So, exactly. And I think the, the initial sort of thought most people can have is that it'll be secured in, in multiple locations, right? They want the make sure thing is not going to be moving around. Right. And the way it's designed is actually that sutures only go here, right? So in the anterior aspect of, of, of the implant, right behind the head of the penis, we're going to sew in the implant uh, into the corporal bodies, right? The reason we want to fix it there and not at the, the back end, right, is that well, when the guy gets an erection, his penis is still going to grow in terms of length, right? And the implant can get pulled off slightly from the pubic bone. If you were to fix it in both ends and the penis wants to sort of expand lengthwise, this is going to restrict it. And we all have a little bit of fat at the base of our base of our penis by the pubic bone, so you can't really see that that gap is forming, but we want that gap to form, right? We want exactly. to pull off the pubic bone. Exactly. So that's why it's only fixed here. Laterally, I always often get questions too, is, well, isn't that going to be flopping around? And, and it really doesn't. The way we sort of create those pockets, especially at the base, so this can sit in there naturally. We can create pockets where this is not going to migrate at all. Um, so that, that's how it's fixed in place, just here and not in the sides, not in the back. Mm -hmm. And the skin holds it in place. It really just hugs those corporal bodies. Sorry. In terms of size, we're really talking about the circumference and the thickness of the implant. So three sizes, dealing with large, extra large, extra, extra. Circumference increases and so does the thickness, right? A lot of this is based just on the patient's natural anatomy, right? Um, what's their, their existing circumference? Um, how much skin do they have? And then the last one is is really what's the the ratio of the head to the to the implant? Uh, I always tell people, well, if I could even fit in an extra extra large to begin with, you have a normal size head, it's gonna look abnormal. It's gonna look like a guy with a small head and a big sport coat. It just That's doesn't it. doesn't look right. So then it looks good and is is not gonna cause any complications for being too large. In terms of length, this is the other one that there's a lot of confusion about. Everyone wants it. I get this question all the time, Doctor, can you leave it as long as possible? I think they all think that that's what they want, but no one actually wants that because what happens if you leave this in too long, say you pretend there's our pubic bone, it's going to ride up on exactly. the pubic bone. It's going to not let sit right. And what else happens? It's, it flattens out. You're going to get that sort of that cone at the base. So you want just the right length. If you sort of short it a bit and let it give it, give it that natural mobility, let it hang, it's going to look more natural. It could probably get some extra length from it not riding up on the bone. Um, so it, it's counterintuitive for patients, but it's, it's, it's really you want just, just the right length for each patient. I was reviewing an article the other day, and that was about the size of the vaginal canal and anal canal. And in terms of like sexual pleasure, there's only so much length that can be used. What's the obsession with length increase? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, I mean, as men, we all know this, this obsession all around the world and we all grew up in different places. And, and I, I'm sure where you grew up is similar to where I grew up in terms of men just thinking that that length oh, is, is the most that, important that, thing. But in terms of data, you know, what data we have from the sort of the sexual medicine world, it seems to suggest that women at least prefer girth in general. So, I mean, obviously, we're always dealing with individuals and not studies, right? I, I tell my patients, you're not, you can't have sex with the average woman from a study. You have sex with the one specific woman. She has her her preferences, and that's why you always have to talk about Panuma with your partner beforehand. At least I recommend it. But you know, you're you're if we're trying to sort of hit that maximum satisfaction for the most number, the greatest number of people, girth is certainly what we want to go for. And a study which was done years ago and was published in the Journal of Obstetric Gynecology regarding length and girth. And almost close to 90% of them, they said we'd rather to have more girth rather than length because the girth gives them more pleasure by touching, you know, G-spot. And that's very natural. I think the number one thing that you have to do is you have to talk to your partner. Sometimes that there is like a desire to be bigger and feel a little bit more confident, but that might not necessarily be the case for your partner and they might not enjoy this. So... This is also part of our informed consent process. We ask right, them, right. have you discussed this with your sexual partner or not? Another thing that comes up, you know, as Ray says, within the past maybe 10 years, I noticed that the number of the female partner that they come with the patients to the office has been almost triple or four times. Originally, maybe they had five or 10 person. 
Now I see between 35 to 40 persons. And sometimes, you know, they ask about what kind of medication, how is the uh, post-op instructions, and she is more concerned than me sure. regarding the follow. And I love that. When the female partner comes, I feel very comfortable because I know if I tell them, okay, don't do this, don't do exercise, hiking, biking, everything, he might not do that. And most of the time, you know, unfortunately, you know, they don't follow the instruction the way we want, but she does. Sure. She will, and I'm sure about it. Let's start with hyaluronic acid. It's a popular material and now got a lot of traction for penis enlargement application. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it certainly has gained a lot of traction in recent years. I, I think when I'll talk to people about my practice in Miami and how proud I am of, of, of Himplant and what great results my patients have gotten, and I'll mention, you know, I'm the only person in the Southeast. I'm the only guy in Florida who does this. And I often hear, you know, no, you're not. There's, you know, three nurse practitioners around the corner who do that. You know, that, that just speaks to the level of awareness about fillers. It also speaks to the fact of well, who's doing them, right? It's, it's not a skilled procedure. Anyone can take a, a syringe and inject someone's penis with it, unlike Pneumo, which really takes, takes quite a bit of skill and, and commitment. You know, fillers initially sound like a great idea. Uh, on its face, you can see why people are, are buy into it, right? It's an injection, it's immediate, it's initially cheaper, um, no general anesthesia, quick, easy, and you're sort of promised the world. Now, what's the downside is that, well, <clears throat> you know, a guy comes to my office, I'm sure you do the same thing. The first question I ask him is, what do you want to get out of this? Why do you want to do this procedure? Right? Because I want to make sure that someone, what they're looking for is something that I can help achieve. I want to make them happy. If I can't achieve their results, if I can't help surprise their girlfriend, I know she's going to be happy. You know, I would never offer the surgery just like sure. you did. I think when you, you look at fillers and, and, and most guys come in, what do they say? They say, I want to be more confident. I want to go into a locker room and feel good. I want to go to a nude beach and feel good. I want to be in my wet bathing suit and feel good. And I want to have fun in the bedroom. So I want something that looks, that's going to look natural and make them feel confident. Something that's going to work. If you're offering a filler and you think about what fillers actually option, uh, offer, I don't think they're going to make anyone happy. I don't think they're going to achieve any of those goals. All right. So what, what happens with a filler? Well the, well, the first thing you're going to notice is it doesn't maintain the normal cylindrical form of a penis. At first glance, is that, you ask yourself, is that going to make a man feel confident? And is that functional? And the answer to both is, is no. So you're already sort of failing that patient on that point. The next one is sort of functionality. They're soft, right? They are soft. They're sort of mobile. Um, it's smushy, right? It's smushy. It's like a marshmallow. It's so it's like if you got your erect penis and stuffed it in a marshmallow and then try to put that in your partner, it doesn't, it doesn't work. It's not functional. So you're not only producing something that doesn't look natural. It's not going to make someone feel confident. It's also not going to perform in the bedroom. So I think if you're, you're being honest and sincere with your patients, you said, I've got this great off, uh, option, it's cheap, it's, it's not invasive. Uh, but if you really told the patient what the outcomes are going to be, no one would ever accept that. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's clear and it's on its face uh, compared to what we have to offer. I mean, this is the gold standard. You can't, can't really compare the two. I've been in, often the, in this practice, you know, in general practice, and especially in this practice, you know, for almost 20 years, you know, just to see, we had exactly the same situation with fat. Fat does absorb because fat has most of the water. Yep. The water does absorb. It's the same thing also with any of these gels. 99% of the gels are water, okay? So the body start to absorb and start to form some kind of uh, skin or lumps under there. And nobody was listening. What happened? Until unfortunately the patient on the table and all, suddenly they inject fat inside the corpus cavernosum and died on the table, okay? Because they think it's just the injection. They go there and they inject in the wrong place and unfortunately the patient dies on the table, okay? So all these things should be considered when we do the surgery. We don't say, you know, that surgery doesn't have complication, possible risk and complication. Every surgery has possible risk and complication. There is no surgery on earth that does not have possible risk and complication. It's interesting that you say that. Um, they're reviewing some of these websites. I read claims that blows my mind. And I think that's what confuses patients. Some of these websites that they do hyaluronic acid or even fat injection that they claim 100% guaranteed. And as a person who worked in healthcare, and I'm not a doctor, but I worked in healthcare, I know there is no such thing in our line of work. There is no 100% guarantee. So if you see claims like that, that's your first red flag. You know, just be mindful, do your research. Obviously, we are biased view him plan. So we have we know which one we prefer. 
But this is more of an honest conversation with you. Make sure that you're not doing something that you regret for the rest of your life. And we've seen a lot of young people that they come to our office in tears and in a situation that it could have been avoided with a little bit more research. That makes me very happy. And at some point makes me very sad and depressed. Makes me happy because it means, you know, that we were successful. We came with an idea that these people never thought of that. And now suddenly it's a wow, such a brilliant idea. I wish I thought, <laughs> okay. So when it comes to you know, any kind of this situation, first, I'm very happy, you know, because if you're not good, if you're not the best, there's no competition, okay? That's number one. Number two, that makes me very sad, I'm happy. Because most of these people, you know, are the physicians, you know, they're the surgeons, okay? So that is something, you know, really breaks my heart. I feel bad. So unfortunately, always, you know, not just in medicine, fake product comes in, but they're not going to stay there. They fade out. If you want to find a legitimate provider, reach out to our team. They can assist you. Go to our website, himfine.com. And there are a bunch of resources. We're actively working on making it more available worldwide and globally. To make sure that everybody can take advantage of this. Well, thank you both so much for the time. Dr. James Ellis. The inventor of the hemp plant. Good doctor DeFazio is in Miami. Pleasure to have you on the team. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much.